Good day. Today is one of those days when there is a lot less news, a lot more less, a lot less reporting um, coming about the situation on the battlefronts in Ukraine, and signs, in, interestingly, that the situation in the Middle East is beginning to quieten. I will come to the Middle East situation shortly. But let's first of all come back to the situation in Ukraine. I should make it very clear that the mere fact that we're getting less information from the battlefronts is not a sign, in my opinion, that things are stabilizing or that the fighting is lessening. On the contrary, my own view is that it's almost certainly a sign of the opposite, that the fighting is actually intensifying and that the Russians are making further progress and that the Russian authorities are therefore tightening on tightening control on the information flow from the soldiers who are actually involved in the fighting, whilst the Ukrainians themselves have very good reasons, obviously, given that it's clear that they are on the back foot across the front lines to say as little as possible about what is actually going on. Anyway, let's nonetheless summarize what information we have. And let's start with the most important news, the news that's become most widely circulated and discussed everywhere, except, by the way, in the Western media. And that is that according to the Russians, the Ukrainians began a major drone offensive once again against the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant in Energoda. This is the biggest nuclear power station in Europe. It's built by the Soviet Union. It is located close to the Dnieper, on, near the Dnieper River, near the Kharkovka Reservoir, which has been drained of much of its water. Though there are some reports that over the course of the winter, um, it gradually began to refill again, and that there's now water where previously there had not been. I'm not going to explore all of that. The Ukrainians have in the past attempted to shell the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Um, this has elicited astonishing convolutions in Western media reporting in the past. Implications that it was the Russians who were themselves shelling their own troops in the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, which they controlled and occupied for some indeterminate purpose that it was difficult to understand. Eventually, the American media, but never to anything like the same extent, the European media, finally acknowledged the obvious truth that it was the Ukrainians who had been shelling the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Then, starting in the autumn of 2022, we had a whole succession of attempts by the Ukrainians to recapture the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, sending special forces across the Dnieper and the Kharkovka reservoir. In every single case, these troops, these special forces, were detected by the Russians. Each operation failed and failed disastrously, but nonetheless, um, the operations were attempted and continue to be attempted for some time. But then eventually, even the Ukrainians, around the time of their summer offensive last year, came to understand that the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant was beyond their reach, that there was no real prospect of its capture, uh, that the shelling of the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant was apparently setting alarm bells in Europe and was leading to, apparently, according to the reports at the time, private expressions of concern communicated to Kiev by European 
governments. And anyway, for a time, the situation around the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant seemed to ease. Well, yesterday that changed. We've had some indications for some time that the Ukrainians were renewing their interest in the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Artillery strikes against the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant having failed in the past. The Russians have built significant containment domes and structures to protect the plant from shelling. Anyway, those attempts having failed, now was the time to try a major drone attack. And indeed, a huge drone attack was indeed launched by the Ukrainians. Um, and some of the drones do seem to have caught through. However, what we hear is that the plant itself has not received significant damage, that none of the shielding around it has been penetrated, that there's no increase in the radiation or anything of that kind, no danger of a radioactive leak or anything like that. But it seems that some of the buildings that house workers at the plant have been attacked and that are reports that there have been some fatalities. The Russian government is today talking extensively about this. They are complaining very strongly about these reckless attacks on the nuclear power plant. They're also putting pressure on the International Atomic Energy Agency, which has representatives, observers at the nuclear power plant, to identify Ukraine as the perpetrator of these attacks. This has been something that the IAEA, under intense Western pressure, has been up to now very cagey about doing. But anyway, one way or the other, what appears to have been a major attack, but not apparently a very successful one in terms of doing structural damage to the plant, but perhaps one intended to frighten and alarm the personnel, the plant personnel, to get them to leave the plant and presumably by getting the personnel to leave to enhance the possibility that the plant itself might be put in a dangerous position or might become right in some way that I don't myself understand for recapture by Ukraine. Why is Ukraine doing this at this particular point in time? Well, my own view is that it is impossible to understand Ukraine's reasons, its motivations in renewing these attacks at this particular point in time, except by refer ref reference to the overall military and political situation. The military situation is now steadily deteriorating. Um, we've had more and more reports about the Ukrainian military being in a poor condition. A Ukrainian officer apparently has said that the manpower shortage is now so acute that many Ukrainian military units are now operating at no more than 40% strength. The ammunition shortage remains also acute. And there was a story, which I'm not sure that I wholly believe it, by the way, it seems so bizarre and far-fetched. It might have been one of those stories that's based on a single incident, but it all seems to me unlikely that this can be happening on a routine basis. But anyway, there was even a story that the Ukrainians, as a result of ammunition shortages, are actually having to hunt the battlegrounds, um, especially places which have 
soft ground and swampy soils and riverbeds and those kind of things to try to find shells that have actually been fired which have failed to explode and which can then be dug up and brought back to the rear and then with some degree of refurbishment can be reused and fired again. I have to say I'm not an expert in shells amongst many other things but this seems to me so, so bizarre, so far-fetched, that I, I wonder whether this isn't more a propaganda tale intended to persuade us that Ukraine's artillery shortage is every bit as acute as we're hearing, and that the West, therefore, is in urgent need of ramping up sh supplies of shells to Ukraine. Just saying, as I said, I, I find this a very difficult story to fully believe. But anyway, the fact is that the Ukrainian army is short of men. It is short of shells. There is huge amount of uncertainty as to the direction of events in the United States. Speaker Johnson is apparently considering putting some kind of aid bill for Ukraine to the House as uh, for a vote. But apparently he's now facing intensifying opposition from within the Republican Party. Marjorie Taylor Greene has been speaking to Tucker Carlson and has been extremely critical of Speaker Johnson's wobbles, as she, as she sees it, on this issue. Um, it's not certain also what form the aid package will take if it is passed at all. It might be apparently significantly amended. Looming on the horizon is the personality of Donald Trump. Now, confirmed as the Republican Party's candidate for the presidential election, there are reports, there were reports yesterday in the American media that Donald Trump is anxious to end the war in Ukraine, that he's prepared to put pressure on the Ukrainians to concede territory to Russia, including Crimea. I have to say that the plans that I've read which have been attributed to Donald Trump and his team, seem to me to be out of date. They're the kind of plans that might have worked had they been floated in 2022. I don't think they take fully into account, or indeed at all into account, the actual military situation on the ground now. But anyway, the fact is that Trump apparently is talking about the need to find some way to end the war and end the war in a way that falls far short of Ukraine's maximalist plans. So the Ukrainians probably unsettled about that. The Ukrainians also probably unsettled about confusing signals coming out of Europe. I will discuss that shortly, but certainly there seems to be now a growing division within Europe. On the one hand, you have President Macron transformed from a relative daft before the special military operation into an arch hawk, the person who wants to send troops, French troops to Ukraine. We'll come to that further. He appears to be trying to persuade the British to join him in this enterprise. Um, we'll discuss that later also. Some countries like the Baltic states seem to be willing to embrace that idea. Against that, there is now a first clear signs of a peace lobby starting to emerge. Pres uh, Prime Minister Orban of Hungary has, of course, always been a consistent critic of the war, of Western policy towards Russia, of Western policy during the war. 
and of the sanctions war. In Slovakia, Prime Minister Fico has successfully formed a government. He appears to be firmly in control. And there has been an election, a presidential election in Slovakia. And importantly, the person who won that election is a political ally of Prime Minister Fico. This is Mr. Pellegrini. He is now the president of Slovakia. He too, having won a clear victory over his pro-NATO opponent, Mr. Pellegrini also strongly supports a peace line over the war in Ukraine. So, Orban, Hungary, are no longer alone on, the, on this topic. And one senses that other European states, Poland continues to have doubts. The previous Polish government, the Law and Justice Party, strongly embraced Ukraine at the beginning. They were Ukraine's most fervid and passionate supporters. Then on the eve of the parliamentary elections last year, they began to realize that the public mood in Poland itself was shifting, that the farming community was becoming increasingly hostile to Ukrainian grain imports. That opposition has since spread to include more parts of the Polish working class. Um, truckers have blockaded the border between Poland and Ukraine. The new government that was formed after the parliamentary elections, led by Donald Tusk, has seemed to want to renew the strong pro-Ukrainian line in Polish policies. However, Donald Tusk is now encountering the same popular opposition within Poland that the previous law and justice government encountered. So Poland perhaps starting to peel away. But anyway, a growing division, it seems to me, between a peace camp led for the moment by two admittedly small countries, Hungary and Slovakia, but probably reflecting wider sentiment across Europe, in Germany, in France, in Britain, in Italy. So a peace camp aligned against a hardline pro-war camp now led by President Macron with various other countries perhaps no longer quite sure which way to jump. Spain, Italy, some of the other Mediterranean states also beginning to have doubts, also beginning to get worried and concerned about a sanctions war that seems to have no end, and also perhaps increasingly thinking about what might happen in the United States, with the worry that if Donald Trump does win the election and American policy changes, then the, the war party in Europe will be left hanging out to dry, and the leaders of these countries don't want to be put in that position also. So you, Ukrainians seeing all of that, seeing this disastrous situation on the battlefronts, seeing cities like Kharkiv cut off from electric power, it's perhaps unsurprising that they want to attract attention, rally Western support, try to provoke the Russians into some massive overreaction that they're trying to get the whole issue of Ukraine further up the agenda. And presumably that is why they're now attacking the Zaporozhye nuclear power station. To say it very straightforwardly, there is an element of blackmail here at work as well. And it's blackmail not so much against the Russians as it is against the Western powers,
and specifically against the Europeans. What the authorities in Kiev seem to be saying is, look, you can't abandon us now. If we go down, we're going to go down in a way that is going to cause the maximum possible harm. And one way we might do it is by inflicting massive damage on a power station, a nuclear power station, and causing some huge radiation leak, which will affect you also. Now, I ought to say that when the Ukrainians were attacking the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant before, I had all kinds of extremely helpful information and advice provided by people who understand these things, or at least understand them a lot better than I do. And of course, this also seemed to be confirmed by a lot of what I was reading in, the, in open sources, which is that the Ukrainians are really on a hiding to nothing here, in the sense that the kind of attacks that they're trying to launch against the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, be they artillery or drone attacks, cannot do the kind of damage that they want and cannot actually cause the kind of massive nuclear incident that perhaps the Ukrainians are trying to threaten. That this is based on a misunderstanding of the structure of power stations, the way the fuel is, uh, nuclear fuel is protected, all of those sort of things, that the Ukrainians perhaps don't really understand that this thing that they're trying to do is actually physically unachievable. Well, if so, that doesn't really surprise me. But as I said, I think that is the motivation. Now, it is not impossible, given that we're talking about Ukraine, that they might also attempt something reckless, like more special forces attacks on the power station to try to seize it, to try to seize control of it back from the Russians. Um, their earlier attempts back in 2022 struck me at the time as so reckless and bizarre that at the time, I actually doubted that they were even real. I thought that the Russians might have been inventing the whole story of some of these special forces commando raids to try to seize the power station. Um, because to me, they seem to be straight out of some kind of James Bond thriller or film and were obviously unworkable. Well, I was completely wrong. The Ukrainians themselves subsequently admitted that they had, in fact, indeed launched these commando raids. There were long descriptions of the planning behind these raids in um, the Western media. I've always found it surprising that the Ukrainians uh, cooperated in describing what were abject failures, but anyway, they did, given that they were able to do something as crazy and irresponsible as that before, who knows, they might try again. Suffice to say that the Russians are much stronger today than they were in 2022, not just in Zaporozhye, but right across the entire battlefronts. I can't imagine that that which failed and failed disastrously in 2022 can succeed this time. So anyway, I've devoted a fair amount of time to the attack on the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Um, to my mind, it is indicative more than anything else of growing Ukrainian alarm and desperation both about the situation on the battlefronts and about the general political situation in the West and the 
state of opinion in the West. I think that the Russians will be able to contain these attacks and repel any special forces attacks. But clearly, this is something that is going to attract international attention. By the way, it is going to infuriate China, which has repeatedly warned that the one thing, the one particular red line which should never be crossed are attacks on nuclear power stations. Well, the Ukrainians have just crossed that red line. They've done so helpfully on the eve of a visit by, helpfully for the Russians, on the eve of a visit by Sergei Lavrov to Beijing. We'll come to that soon. But anyway, the Ukrainians have done that. It's a sign of their growing alarm and despondency as the situation in the war gets worse. So let's turn now to the situation in the actual war itself. And I want to reiterate again a point I've made before. Um, I want to uh, just repeat it one further time, that the main fighting, the main battle on the front lines continues to take place in central Donbass, in the area between Marinka in the south and Siversk to the north, or perhaps we should even narrow that theater of the main Russian advances even further from Marinka in the south to Bakhmut in the north, because this is where the most intense battles are happening. Now, there is a lot of fighting going on in Zaporozhye region. The Russians gradually nibbling away at Bradley Square, the salient the Ukrainians captured um, during their summer offensive, if that's the right word. Anyway, the Russians have been nibbling away at it, gradually gaining more and more ground. The Ukrainians continuing to cling on to part of Rabotino, maybe most of Rabotino, I'm not even sure. But anyway, they're still there. Fighting still goes on there sporadically. The Russians have launched some rather interesting attacks in the Vremevka salient area towards these villages of Staromayorsk and Urajaina that the Ukrainians uh, um, attacked and claimed to have captured in August of last year. But again, it's very much a stop-go operation by the Russians. The Russians have also recently been more active in Zaporozhye region, moving northwards towards the town of Gulyapolye, um, captured a village in that area some weeks ago. Um, operations seem to be taking place there on a fairly significant scale and there's also Russian operations going on around Vugleda. The Russians have apparently occupied more ground around Vugleda. Quite plausibly, they're shaping the battlefield around Vugleda in anticipation of an eventual offensive to capture this important fortified town. And the Russians have also been busy in the north. There were many reports that they'd stopped fighting around Kupiansk, but in fact, fighting around Kupiansk does still take place fairly often. There has been a lot of talk recently about the supposed defeat of a Russian armoured advance towards Terni and about the build-up of a large Ukrainian forces there. I'm going to return later to what is going on in Terni because it's clear to me that the situation is a great deal more complicated than some reports are suggesting. And there's a lot of discussion, commentary about fighting um, around Siversk. The Russians seem to be gradually edging to encircle Belogorovka, village to the west of Siversk advancing up the railways north towards Siversk from the south. Again, it looks like they're shaping the battlefield there. 
But the main battles are happening elsewhere. And briefly, the main battles are happening around Marinka, in places like Novomikhailovka, uh, Krasnogorovka, and Georgievka. They're happening to the west of Bakhmut. Um, and with the main battle now being for the capture of this town of um, uh, Pervomaisky that I've been talking about rather a lot recently. And, of course, the other major battle is taking place um, in and around Bakhmut. And specifically, there has been this major Russian advance over the last um, few days towards um, Chasafya. And it's here that we're getting the most information and the most attention. Now, it's not entirely easy to work out what exactly is happening around um, um, Chasafya in Chasafya. But overall, I think that it is possible to get some sense of the nature of the battle. It does look as if the Russians have, in fact, broken into Chasafya. They now occupy some of the buildings in the eastern part of Chasafya. The main battle has happened to the northwest of Chasafya, and there were lots of reports yesterday that the Russians have now effectively captured the village of Bogdanovka. Um, there might be a few outlying buildings of Bogdanovka at the very western tip of this rather large village, which the Ukrainians still control. But overall, the Russians now control the whole of Bogdanovka. Um, various commentators, Dima at the military summary channel, for example, are claiming that the Ukrainians have um, withdrawn or chose to withdraw from Bogdanovka. I'm not sure, by the way, why the Ukrainians would choose to withdraw from Bogdanovka. But anyway, that they were, they've retreated from Bogdanovka, but that they have established strong positions to the um, north of Bogdanovka, um, in um, around another village, and that this um, place that they have occupied this time is um, on a higher elevation, and the village in question is Kalinina, and that so long as the Russians are unable to capture Kalinina, um, the Ukrainians still have an opportunity, a possibility of stabilizing the situation um, in this area. Well, that may be true. Now, early this morning, I should say that I did see a report which claimed that the Russians have actually reached Kalinin Kalinina and that they are, in fact, fighting there. That might suggest, if it is true, <laughs> that the Russians are, in fact, um, that they managed to storm this elevation, this hill. Uh, the reports are extremely unclear and very sketchy, and maybe we shouldn't take them altogether seriously. But suffice to say that, quite plausibly, the Russians, having captured Bogdanovka, will indeed move on to attack Kalininda. It is apparently on a hill, um, but there's been many claims in the past that the Russians aren't able to capture places on hills or that it's capturing places on hills is a particular challenge for them. We saw that with a hill that lay immediately to the north of Ivanivska, but the Russians did in fact manage to capture the hill north of Ivanivska. And I th I'm going to repeat again a point that I've made before. If the Russians 
put their mind to it, there is no fortified position anywhere on the Ukrainian battlefronts, which I think they cannot capture. And if Kalinina is that important, they will capture it. If it is, as I happen to believe, actually their objective to capture Chasov Yar. And, well, if you look at the map, and the Russians do indeed successfully capture um, Kalinina, then a number of things actually start to happen, because with Kalinina under control, under Russian control, and with the Russians also in control, apparently, or very close to another village, Orekhovo Vasilyevka, to the north, um, it starts to look as if Ukrainian positions to the north of Chasofya will start to crumble. And anyway, the Russians, through their control of Bogdanovka and Kalinina, would be in a very strong position indeed, should they choose to, to advance beyond the canal and attack the main part of Chasofya, which lies to the west of the canal. Now, just saying. Now, for the moment, however, the, mo the major fighting in Bakhmut, or rather in Chasofya, is not taking place west of the canal. It continues to be concentrated in this. Actually, from the maps that I have seen and from the pictures of it that I have seen, relatively confined and small micro district to the west of the canal. And if the Russians already control one or two buildings there, then actually, given the fact that there are not that many buildings in this micro district to start with, that is already a major advance. And one way or the other, the Russians, as I discussed in my program yesterday, seem to have advanced south of Kalinina, west of the micro district. Again, if you look at a map, you can see how this would be possible. And they seem to be moving towards cutting off the micro district from resupply by the main Ukrainian forces that are still located in Chasofya, in the main part of Chasofya, west of the canal. And there are lots of reports that the fields between the micro district and the canal and the canal itself are now covered by Russian artillery and Russian drones. And of course, beyond that, there are also reports that the Russians are now advancing from Ivanivska, that they're pushing steadily towards Chasofya from the south east, and that they are gradually um, dispersing or defeating the rather scattered Ukrainian forces that are located in these fields, which are basically the troops, the Ukrainian troops, that pulled out of Ivaniska when the Russians captured it, and probably Ukrainian troops that are also being withdrawn from the more southerly positions they'd occupied around Klesheevka and Andreevka, further to the south. So, a very complex battle going on at Chasofya, but clearly the Russians holding the initiative. And there are lots of reports of intense Russian bombing of Chasofya, both the micro district and the main town west of the canal. Reports that the Russians already control the um, built up area to the north east of the micro district. This is an area of small cottages and such things. Uh, we're not talking here about the bigger apartment buildings. But anyway, that area supposedly already captured by the Russians. The Russians are sort of bombing the Ukrainians, 
with Fab 500 and Fab 1500 bombs in Chasofya itself and in the micro district. And apparently, Suhoi 25 ground attack aircraft, very powerful ground attack aircraft, the Russian analog to the American A 10 Thunderbolt, though it should be said it has a completely different design philosophy. It's a, a lighter, smaller, faster aircraft, though subsonic, and it doesn't have quite as powerful a cannon as the A-10 Thunderbolt does, but it can carry a powerful load of equipment. Anyway, apparently Sukhoi 25s bombing Ukrainian positions in Chasofya and in the micro district regularly and using principally, it seems, rather powerful unguided rockets, S-8 rockets, which they're launching against Ukrainian positions. And lots of comments about how there is no Ukrainian air defense operating over Chasofya. The Russians, the Russian aircraft, are able to operate at will, and um, Russian drones able to do the same. So, a major battle going on for Chasofya. As I've discussed so many times in connection with other places where the fighting has happened, Mariupol, Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, Akhmet, Avdevka. However bitter the Ukrainian resistance, the eventual outcome is not in doubt. And I think, again, this needs to be made clear. If the Russians are determined to take the micro district, they will. If the Russians intend to move beyond the canal and to take Chasofya itself, they will. If the Ukraine, the Russians choose to move beyond Chasofya towards the town of Konstantinovka, further to the southwest, they can. And if they choose to take Konstantinovka, which is also, by the way, located on the railway lines, and move on from Konstantinovka towards Kramatorsk, well, they can do that too. But it may take them time. There may be a lot of fighting still to do. But of course, the Russians have the resources, they have the manpower, they have the equipment, they have the artillery, they have the bombs, they have the drones. They will be able, eventually, to achieve all of these objectives, however long, however much time it takes them to do it. So that's what I'm going to say about the fighting around Chasofya. Now, the other place where intense fighting is going on is in the area west of Avdevka. And here again, we have a very complex story. Um, lots of fighting as the Russians work to clear Pervomaisky. And there are reports that the Russians are now preparing for an assault on Manske, which is uh, to the west, and on Natalova, uh, Umansk is to the west of Orlovka and Toninka, and Netailova is to the west of um, Pervomaisky and Vodiane. This, these are the places um, that um, we've just been hearing about uh, where the, uh, fighting has taken place already. And there is reports for example, in the Kiev Post, which tells us that Russian troops advanced behind heavy airstrikes up to two kilometers taken near Avdevka. And the Kiev Post tells us that Kiev's capacity to combat Moscow's long-range glide bombs is iffy and might be getting worse. And it looks as if the Russians, now working very hard, Probably Pervomaisky likely to fall very soon. Um, 
Ukrainians, the Ukrainians have been trying to reinforce there, but the Russians have gained more territory in the Avdeevka area. As I said, this report has come out from the Kiev Post um, within the last hour. So we see that the fighting is continuing to go very much in the Russian direction. And we've had comments like Kremlin forces leading off with saturating airstrikes with long-range glide bombs have torn into Ukrainian's defences in multiple sectors and have gained around two kilometres of ground west of the battlefield city of Avdevka. News and official reports said on Monday, in other words today, and Russian commanders have deployed multiple Suhoi 34 bombers, dropping half-ton glide bombs to blast Ukrainian forces. When we start to get reports like this um, from the Ukrainians, it's a sign that the situation on the battle lines is becoming very difficult for the Ukrainians indeed. And to repeat again, I think it is highly likely, therefore, that the Ukrainians are now starting to prepare us for perhaps news that Pervomaisky has been captured by the Russians. There are still reports that the Russians have captured Berdichi, but there's also reports that the Ukrainians are still fighting in that village. But there is no doubt that the Russians control most of it. And there's also intense fighting going on in Semenyon, Semenyovka, immediately to the south of Berdichi. But, well, we see that the Ukrainians are facing intense pressure in that, in that area and are losing ground. And yesterday there was a whole cluster of reports about the fighting further south in Marinka, um, that the Russians have made further headway in Georgievka. Uh, that they're bombing Krasnogorovka very hard. I noticed that some commentators, um, Dima at the Military Summary Channel, continue to insist, for example, that the Russians have withdrawn completely from Kras Krasnogorovka. Other commentators, and here I think they're more reliable and more likely to be correct, still say that the Russians are um, there, present in the southern part, of Krasnogorovka and that there is intense fighting going on around. But to repeat again, if the Russians, or rather I should correct that, when the Russians complete the capture of, Kras of Pervomaisky, Krasnogorovka itself, its days will be numbered. And by the way, I've seen various maps now produced by various Russian sources. They seem to assumed that Nevolskoy, this village to the south of Pervomaisky and north of Krasnogorovka, remains securely under Russian control. So anyway, battles not going on well for Ukraine in all of these places. And bitter complaints about the power of the Russian Air Force. Now, I'm going to come back to this question of what happened near the village of Terni the other day because I've you know, been receiving lots of comments about this, many claiming that a major Ukrainian victory was achieved close to Terni, that a huge Russian armoured column advanced towards Terni, that 31 Russian armoured vehicles, some claim even as many as 100 Russian armoured vehicles destroyed by FPV drones, that kind of thing. Well, the first thing to say is that there is film that does indeed show, or appear to show, a Russian armoured column advancing towards Terni. And it is clear that that column was stopped in its tracks. There were major drone attacks by the Ukrainians. There are claims that um, the anti-drone equipment, the jamming equipment in the lead tank broke down or didn't work and that exposed 
the entire column to um, attack by the Ukrainians and large numbers of vehicles therefore had to be abandoned or were destroyed over the course of this attack. Now the first thing to say is that we don't know for a fact that these vehicles were all destroyed. Some of them may have been damaged, some of them may have been left by the Russians intact. I suspect that this is territory which the Russians control over the course of night most of these vehicles, if as many as that number of vehicles were indeed destroyed or, or damaged or abandoned, many of these vehicles will be pulled back to the Russian lines and will be refitted and refurbished there. So an attack towards Terni failed, failed badly. But how does this change the outcome of the war, how does this change the situation in Terni itself? Well, again, previously, over the course of the previous week, lots of reports from many people about the Russian advance towards Terni. And there were lots of reports about how the Russians had actually captured Terni at one point and were intent on capturing other villages to the south of the Zherebets River. There was no proof of that, and it's clear that that never happened. The Russians then arrived close to Terni, just as they arrived recently close to Kupiansk, and then they stopped. And this puzzles many people, and it leads to many questions about why did the Russians fail to press home their attack on Terni once they arrived so close to Terni? Well, we see from the evidence of this armoured advance towards Terni that the Russians have at least considered attacks on Terni, but having obviously run into resistance, they've decided not to press home those attacks. The major reason, I think, is again for the Russians, Terni, like Sinkovka further north, Kupiansk itself, at the moment are secondary objectives. The Russians are not prepared to commit huge numbers of troops and um, accompanying aircraft and drone vehicles and that kind of drone operators and drones to an attack on a secondary objective. What the advance first towards Kupiansk and then towards Terni, however, obliged the Ukrainians to do was to redeploy huge numbers of forces to try to defend Terni, small insignificant village, but also the crossings on the Zherebets River. And on his very last video, um, Dima at the Military Summary Channel um, recited an absolutely staggering number of Ukrainian military units that are now deployed in the Terni area. Um, I recognized one or two of them. One in particular was the 71st Jaeger Brigade, very much an elite brigade, used by Ukraine in the um, summer offensive is one of the units that tried to launch attacks towards Robotino and to break through the Russian lines there. But there's been all sorts of other brigades redeployed to Terni, some importantly from the Avdevka area, which is where, by the way, the 71st Brigade was also previously deployed. Now, the point is that Avdevka, the Avdevka area, as I have already said, is a major focus of Russian advances. I mean, the Russians are clearly intent on pushing further west from Avdevka. The Kiev post has just told us that they are continuing their advances there. They're in the process of capturing Pervomaisky. They have... Uh, reached the village of Natalova, 
uh, and the village of Umansk. They are they recently captured the village and district of Odiane, um, northern Pervomaisky. They are making a major advance there. So every elite unit that the Ukrainians redeploy from Avdehevka to Terni, a far less important place for the Russians, is for the Russians a plus because it weakens Ukrainian positions around Avdehevka which is the focal point, what the Germans, by the way, once upon a time referred to as the Schwerpunkt of the Russian, current Russian military operations alongside Chasev Yar and Yorgevka, Krasnogorovka, Novomikhailovka in central Donbass. So the Russians have already achieved that. But they are also achieving something else. Now, um, one of the claims that I've noticed um, um, Dima has recently been making is that the Ukrainians have been launching many drone strikes and artillery strikes on Russian positions east of the Zherebets River but that the Russians have not been doing the same thing and that the Ukrainians therefore have drone and artillery dominance in this area. Now, if you go to the Russian Defense Ministry report, the one that, the very latest one that's just been published, uh, was published late last night, that appears to contradict this. Firstly, the Russian Defense Ministry says that over the course of yesterday, 7th April, the Russians um, repelled two counterattacks by assault groups of the 95th Air Assault Brigade of the Ukrainian military near Terni. And they say that over the course of this Ukrainian counterattack. The Ukrainians lost 30 men, one tank, two armored fighting vehicles, and two motor vehicles. Obviously, not 31 armored vehicles, but anyway, the Russians say that they were able to repel this attack. Well, that's interesting, and it might not have been a particularly major attack. Consider what the Russians are saying about the destruction of Ukrainian artillery in this area, and also, by the way, in the uh, Kupiansk area. They say that over the course of yesterday, just yesterday, the Russians, as a result of counter-battery warfare, in other words, as a result of artillery duels, destroyed two... 152 millimeter Akatsia self-propelled artillery systems, one 122 millimeter Gvostika self-propelled artillery system, one 152 millimeter D20 gun, one 220 millimeter Uragan multiple rocket launch system, one 122 millimeter Grad multiple rocket launch system. One U.S. manufactured AN TPQ-50 counter-battery warfare radar and one NOTA electronic warfare station. That is a large amount of artillery in the Kupiansk Terni area, all destroyed over the course of one day. And by the way... It is consistent with a major Russian drive to destroy Ukrainian artillery. And if the Ukrainians lost a large number of artillery pieces in the Kupiansk Terni area, they lost even more in the area of the fighting, in other areas of the fighting. Um, specifically around Chasov Yar and 
also in the um, area um, around Georgievka, uh, um, Krasnokorovka, and Novobikhailovka. This is what the Russians say. The Ukrainians lost. The amount of artillery they lost. Um, just again over the course of a single day in in that area, the southern Donetsk direction, the Marinka area, if you prefer. One 155mm M777 howitzer. Two US manufactured 105mm M119 guns. One British manufactured 150mm FH70 howitzer. One German manufactured 155mm uh, PZH 2000 self propelled artillery system. Three 152mm D20 howitzers. One 152mm Acacia self propelled artillery systems. Three 122mm D30 howitzers. One ammunition depot. Three Nauta electric warfare electronic warfare stations. And this has been, by the way, a pattern for some days. The Russians, having inflicted catastrophic damage on Ukraine's air force, I discussed that at length in the autumn. Ukraine's air force, to all intents and purposes, no longer functions. The Ukrainians now are waiting for their F-16s, but they're going to arrive in small numbers without much sign, without much hope that that's going to change anything significant on the battlefronts. The Russians having destroyed the Air Force, having effectively destroyed Ukraine's air defense system. Yesterday, by the way, the Russian Defense Ministry tells us that they destroyed two launchers, two more S-300 surface-to-air missile launchers along with one P-18 radar system. And there are reports that Ukraine has stopped trying to shoot down Russian missiles. They're husbanding their limited stock of air defense missiles, trying to protect Kiev itself and perhaps Lviv, but basically no longer defending anywhere else, and occasionally shooting down drones, which again, I find difficult to understand. But anyway, having in effect destroyed Ukraine's air force and Ukraine's um, air defense system, the Russians now seem to be concentrating on destroying Ukraine's artillery pool. Now, Two days ago, as I discussed in my programme yesterday, I received a report, or rather an email from a source, a very well-informed source, explaining the situation with the supply of shells to Ukraine by the Western powers. He said that Ukraine is actually receiving rather more shells than has been reported. That may be true, but he also said that Ukraine is now running desperately short of artillery systems. And, well, that was just one report from the Russian Defence Ministry that I provided, that, that we see. We see how many artillery systems now the Russians are destroying in Ukraine in any single day. And they're able to do that because they have now have comprehensive drone coverage across the battlefronts uh, with more and more of the fortified positions having been captured. The Ukrainians are obliged to keep their artillery in the fields um, where there's less cover. And the Russians have increasingly deployed longer range artillery, some of which uses um, these Krasnopol um, precision-guided shells, which are particularly effective for counter-battery work. And note, by the way, that the precision-guided Excalibur shells that the United States used to supply 
but we no longer hear anything about them. So clearly, the Russians are pushing back internally in some form. They are destroying a lot of Ukrainian artillery pieces, it seems, in that area. And I think for the Russians, given that this is a, still, to a certain extent, an artillery war, that remains an important priority. Let's talk about the air defense situation. I mentioned that the Ukrainians are now husbanding what few air defense missile systems they have left and how the Russians continue their hunt for Ukrainian air defense systems. They've just destroyed, according to their claims, two more S-300 missile systems. Perhaps the best sign of how desperate the Ukrainians are becoming here is that Zelensky has recently pleaded for delivery of 25 complete Patriot missile systems with eight launchers per system. Eight launchers, six to eight launchers per system. Which, by the way, I understand, in effect, translates to 25 Patriot brigades. Well, the US military itself apparently operates just 16 Patriot missile brigades. Um, so Zelensky wants more Patriot missile launchers and systems than the United States operates itself. Um, I understand it's been suggested that, in fact, what Zelensky is demanding is more Patriot missile launchers and systems and missiles than exist in the entirety of the world. That tells us, however hyperbolic Zelensky's pleas are, that tells us how desperate the situation with air defense systems has now become. Ukraine finds itself in that situation, which I remember warnings, there were warnings about it being made some time ago, way back in the autumn of 2022, when its air defense system has essentially collapsed, allowing the Russian Air Force to operate effectively at will, and the effect on the front lines is devastating and is enabling the Russians to press forward with their offensive. So anyway, that is the situation on the front lines. Now, there has been an incredibly intelligent article by Matthew Blackburn in The National Interest. This is one of that triad of um, American um, foreign policy magazines, along with foreign affairs and foreign policy, which provides us with... Um, the overview, the, the, the discussions that the US foreign policy establishment discusses. Anyway, in it, Matthew Blackburn now straightforwardly talks about the looming Ukrainian debacle. There is indeed a serious risk that rather than the West teaching Russia a les lesson and put it, putting Putin in his place, the opposite may occur. And I'm not going to read the whole article, but um, Blackburn laments that um, instead of realism, there's a lack of it. Um, what is lacking throughout the discourse is realism. Um, he says that the West has completely underestimated and miscalculated about Russia. He says that um, um, Western leaders are reluctant to admit that the dire situation facing Ukraine is related to their own fundamental miscalculations about Russia. Russia's multiple blunders in this war are well known. 
But what of those made by the Western alliance? And he makes the point that the current Russian plan, the plan of attrition, what I actually call aggressive attrition, is slowly succeeding and um, that the West, for its part, is still effectively stuck with plan A, um, achieving mis victory over Russia um, with inadequate means in Ukraine, and that can't win. And he is also particularly critical of the rhetoric, the rhetoric that the West cannot let Russia win, the rules-based order would unravel, there is the new domino theory, if Ukraine falls, Russian hordes will flood further west. He says he laments the personalization of, of the conflict onto one evil man, Vladimir Putin, the talk of a manicured struggle of good and evil, democracy and authoritarianism, civilization and darkness. There can be no peace until the tyrant falls. The Western alliance must not waver in its commitment to Ukraine. And he says all this rhetoric is achieving nothing. He says that experts assured us that Russia would weaken. Um, and this, however, has not materialized. Uh, Russia's economy was rated as weak and vulnerable to sanctions. Um, the Russian military was assumed to be weak. In reality, Western sanctions on Russia's energy exports have backfired damaging European economies more than Russia's, um, the hope that most non-Western states would stop trading with Russia have, has proved unfounded. Um, the assumption that Russia is a kleptocracy led to personal sanctions on wealthy Russians that were expected to have political side effects, losing access to their assets and luxuries in the West would turn Russian kleptocrats against Putin. Instead, the sanctions have largely incentivized them to invest their money in their own country and give their loyalty to the regime. Western sanctions have thus been a double failure. They did not wreck the Russian economy or de destabilize the elite coalition around the regime. And he's, he's scathing about the claims about Russian losses. He says claims of Russian high Russian losses linked to corruption, poor morale and disorganization. Most commentators have accepted at face value Ukrainian, US and British estimates of Ukrainian lo of Russian losses, as well as the equipment loss count of the open source intelligence unit Oryx. The claims of astronomical Russian losses reinforce the long-standing assumption of West NATO military superiority over Russia. The assumptions have now been proved incorrect. The drip feeding of advanced weaponry uh, has not allowed the Ukrainians to achieve decisive results. Whereas the Russians, better prepared for the long haul of military production and have successfully innovated in response to military setbacks. So, um, he says that despite all of these setbacks, all of these failures, because there's no willingness to acknowledge them, the West continues with its plans. More sanctions, new weapons, more training for Ukraine, all supposedly to prepare Ukraine for another offensive in 2025. And he says that this simply cannot work. He says that... Um, the um, reality um, is that um, far from the West um, dealing a lesson on the Russians, it's more likely that it will be the Russians who inflict a lesson on the West. Russia is, in fact, educating the West on what it means to use hard power and wage interstate conflict in 21st century conditions. Russia advertises its version of great power sovereignty, 
in which a united, resilient and unwavering state can defeat the pooled sovereignty of the EU and NATO. And he says that um, we have all heard the objection that Putin simply cannot be trusted and that he wants nothing less than the complete elimination of Ukraine as an independent state. Yet does not the blind continuation of the West's dysfunctional plan A also threaten the total physical destruction of Ukraine. And he says that a new approach to the war is therefore needed. And it's quite clear that what Matthew Blackburn is working towards is a suggestion that the West should instead embrace serious negotiations with the Russians. But of course, that is not what we are now seeing. We've had reports in the Washington Post, or rather the Wall Street Journal, not the Washington Post, that Macron, President Macron France, remains committed to his project of intervention, military intervention, by France in Ukraine. That his latest plan is to stop the Russians winning in Ukraine by sending French troops to Ukraine. He came up against a wall of opposition from the Germans and the Americans. He's had to reassure the Americans and the Germans that if French troops do enter Ukraine, the French will not expect or demand that the Americans will, come to, will need to come to their rescue if those French troops get into trouble. This is what the Wall Street Journal tells us. And that the French are happy to take on the Russians all by themselves. That is a ludicrous and absurd idea. Um, anyone with any knowledge or understanding of the military realities knows that France lacks the means to intervene effectively in Ukraine by itself. Macron appears to be reaching out to the British. There's a long article today in the Daily Telegraph, joint article by the British and French defense minister, foreign ministers, hailing the Entente Cordiale that these two countries, Britain and France, concluded in the run-up to the First World War and which made them, in effect, allies against Germany. The reality is that the British military is even weaker than the French military. Um, adding the French and the British together, you still got, don't get anything remotely capable of taking on the Russians in Ukraine. I don't know whether the Americans or the Germans understand this, but I can't help but think that Macron's actual plan, if he is indeed allowed to send troops, French troops to Ukraine, is to create a situation where the U Americans are forced to intervene when France and Britain presumably run into trouble or face the potential collapse of NATO. Now, whether that is understood in Washington, I'm not really sure. Um, I hope that people in the military do understand it, and I hope that they're explaining this to the US government. I hope that they also make it absolutely clear to Macron that the United States is not only opposed, not only will not come to France's rescue if France gets into trouble in Ukraine, but that it in fact opposes the French deployment to Ukraine at all. I know there is a huge amount of opposition against this crazy idea in France itself, but anyway, we will see what comes one way or the other, this is another crazy scheme, and it is one that is 
potentially full of the most extreme dangers and which, of course, risks involving the United States in even more problems. Now, I've already discussed in recent videos how the Chinese are now telling themselves that the United States is bogged down in Ukraine and in the Middle East, that it cannot afford a conflict in Taiwan over Taiwan or in the South China Sea, how that actually incentivizes the Chinese to continue and in fact even increase their support for the Russians. Uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, is in Beijing talking to Wang Yi, even as I make this program, allowing themselves to be lured into President Macron's European adventures, Ukrainian adventures, is only going to compound this problem, quite apart from the enormous risks of nuclear escalation that this kind of wild thinking um, involves. I very much hope that the Americans, as I said, wake up to the dangers of this and call a stop. Meanwhile, maybe they should take lessons from what is happening elsewhere in the other conflict in the Middle East. Israel has now pulled out nearly all its troops from Gaza. Apparently there's only one brigade left there. Hamas is still in existence. Um, the Israelis claim that they've severely defeated or depleted its army, but the fact is that Hamas has survived as a military organization. I understand that there is considerable recriminations about all of this in Israel itself. Avigdor Lieberman, important Israeli politician of Russian origin, by the way, and it must be said, a long-term rival of Prime Minister Netanyahu has been angrily complaining about the mishandling of the war. He compares Israel's victories in the 1967 war, which lasted all of six weeks, with this war in Gaza, which has lasted six months, the longest war Israel has ever fought, and one which has achieved None of the objectives, the destruction of Hamas, the liberation of Gaza from Hamas's control, the freeing of the hostages, none of the objectives that Israel set itself. And across the Middle East, we see that the United States has not been able to defeat the Houthis. The Houthis have apparently attacked no fewer than 90 ships in the Red Sea, and there has been nothing that the United States can do to change that situation. And in the meantime, the damage to American prestige has been appalling. And of course, Israel itself has become a pariah for most of the world. Getting trapped into indefinite commitments, handing out blank checks to other parties is a way to disaster. <clears throat> this debacle in the Middle East, which is what we are now seeing, began with a blank check that President Biden gave to Prime Minister Netanyahu back in October. At the Duran, we warned against it at the time, and now we're seeing the results. Giving a blank check to Emmanuel Macron is every bit as stupid. The stakes, however, are much higher and far more dangerous. At the very least, if France and Britain plunge into some adventure in Ukraine, 
on the basis of an American blank check and are then obliterated by the Russians and come crawling to the Americans for help, which the Americans decide they cannot give, then that blank check America has given will in effect have bounced and the effect on American prestige and authority in Europe will be catastrophic and we might indeed at that point in actually be discussing the end of NATO. Alternatively, if the United States feels that it has no choice but to intervene, well then it is up against a nuclear power and the stakes are unimaginably greater. Blank checks should never be given out in this way. The United States seems unwilling to take on Iran in the Middle East. It should be far more careful about taking on Russia, a far more powerful nuclear armed country, far more powerful than Iran. No blank checks to President Macron. On the contrary, what President Macron needs is a stern lecture, not encouragement. What exactly he's about, why he's decided to lose his mind in this crazy way, I have no idea. But the risks of failure are enormous and the consequences of miscalculation are beyond catastrophic. I hope there are some people in Washington who still understand this. Well, this is where I end my programme today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all of our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. Don't forget that you can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. You can also check out our shop where you can get yourself all the amazing things there. Our sweatshirts, our t-shirts, our magic mugs, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this program. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.